Well, praise God. God's presence is in the house. God is working. God is working. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Well, some are still praying, and you can continue to pray. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. 1 through 5 of Revelation chapter 22. Praise God. This is what I'm looking forward to. This is the Apostle John. He saw something I've never seen. I've only got what he recorded in the Spirit. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Must be a mighty big tree. Which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit Every month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. I've never seen his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. Praise God. One more verse. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp. Nor the light of the sun. For the Lord gives them light. And they shall reign forever and forever. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. I'll preach a real simple message to you this morning. Simple message is simply this. Blessed are the free. You may be seated this morning in this house. Amen. God is here where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. In other words, you may come into this house bound, you may come into this house struggling, but God's Spirit is in this house, and where His Spirit is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Hallelujah, there is freedom. Freedom. Hallelujah, and people were expressing themselves up here just a few moments ago, they were demonstrating freedom. I know it may seem strange to some of you, but they were demonstrating freedom. Praise God. I've never been in a mash pit. I have no intentions of ever being in a mash pit. I don't know, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. I ain't going to go down there and bounce my body against somebody else, see if I can knock them over, bloody them up a little bit or something. And they call that freedom. But I've been in the presence of God, and it wasn't a mash pit up here today, but people were free in God to worship God. And what you, my friend, need to know is blessed are the free. Praise God. It doesn't start when we get to heaven. It starts now. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Are you with me this morning? (laughs) My God. My God. I've had many, many Bible studies. You may be seated. I've had many Bible studies. And uh, I'm not throwing my Bible studies away. I'm not burning my Bible studies. (laughs) That's an inside joke here, folks. 
Hallelujah. But I've gone through the chapter one of Genesis with people and the six days of creation and how God, the Spirit of God, hovered over the face of the deep. And amen. If you'll read in there, it was like a wasteland. And amen. God spoke, and when God speaks, things take place. So I've read all the way through that first chapter, and you will read at the very end of that first chapter of Genesis. The Bible says in verse 31 that God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Now he said that in the evening on the sixth day, ladies and gentlemen. Are are you still with me? He said that on the sixth day, amen, that it was very good. In other words, when God looked at the creation, what happened on the sixth day? I'll tell you what happened on the sixth day. He formed man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into man, and man became a living soul. And he said it was very good. That's what he said. God said it. I didn't say it. He said it. He said it was very good. Hallelujah. The only, only thing that God said wasn't good You'll find in chapter 2, it wasn't good that man be alone. And if we got some smart husbands in the house, they did something about that yesterday. And if you didn't do anything about it yesterday, there you have it. I didn't say it. Somebody else said it. Of course, ladies, it works two ways. Were you your husband's valentine? Well, that quieted down a little bit here. Praise God. Now, I wish I had a picture of how it was, Nathan. My God. I wish I had how it was. You understand, in the garden, there was no sickness. You understand, in the garden, there was, amen, no pain. No misery of any kind. You understand, in the garden, that Adam and Eve didn't have any hang-ups. They didn't retreat to some corner of the garden and not talk to each other for a couple hours or a couple days or a week. And you got somebody in your home that's not talking to you. You want to know how to break that? You give them permission not to talk to you because, you see, the issue is an issue of power or control. And as long as they, amen, seem to be able to control this situation by not talking to you. But the moment you say, you got permission not to speak to me, is the moment the power is broken and they're no longer in control. Are, are you with me? You know, but, but Adam and Eve didn't have any hang-ups. Didn't have any hang-ups. Didn't have any bad days. Didn't burn breakfast. Scorched dinner. It was everything was good. It was good. My God. They didn't even have navels. I was wondering how long it would take you to figure out that one. Some caught it right away. Somebody said, navel? What are we talking about? Ships or something? No, this your belly button. See, well, that's really profound, preacher. Well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And if you don't understand it was the chicken... You need to go back to 101 in the Bible, in creation. All right? It's perfect. Perfect. Hallelujah. In fact, in heaven it had been perfect until iniquity was found in the heart of an angelic being. And it changed then. And that evil one used a serpent on this planet to tempt Eve and Adam. You know, this is a sideline here, Reggie. Are you quick? Go with me to go with me to Psalms 91, about verse 12. Just a quick, can, can we do this right in the middle of what I'm trying to preach? My God, I want to kill the spirit. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Now, do you know who goes by that description of being a lion and an adder or a snake or a dragon? There's only one in the Bible. And Psalms 91 says you're going to tread 
upon the lion and the adder and the young lion, the dragon, shall trample under your feet. Hallelujah. That's what the Word of God says. You see, that's how it was in the garden. Until the serpent was able to beguile Eve. Amen. And Adam, the Bible says, in disobedience, amen, disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of that tree that they were not supposed to eat of. And then everything changed. And as I stand here before you today, I deal with the change that came about because of the sin of man, amen, and the beguilement and the temptation of the evil one. I hate him. You see, what God said was very good. Changed. Changed. Everybody say changed. It changed. Hallelujah. Until the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 21 that creation itself waits for deliverance. Why does it wait for deliverance? Because of the bondage of corruption. And so you and I live in a world today filled with the curse of death. Amen. And decay and corruption. I don't know much about science. Amen. But the second law of thermodynamics simply says this. The universal tendency for all systems and processes is to decay and become more random and disordered. That happened after man disobeyed God. What was right, what was true, amen, what was even, amen, what was ordered became disordered. Do you understand today that cancer is simply rogue cells in somebody's body that got out of control? How did that come to be? I'll tell you how that came to be. It's because, amen, man rejected God's law, amen, and from that came corruption, decay, and death. The curse. Everybody say the curse. You don't understand the second law of thermodynamics? I'll tell you what you do. If God gives us another 30 years, don't you do anything to your house. Don't ever paint anything anymore. When the hinge gets rusty on the door, leave it alone. When somebody breaks a window in your house, don't fix it. When a shingle comes off the roof, let it come off. Do nothing with it. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you what you'll have in 30 years. An uninhabitable home. Why? Because everything in this world is in the process of decay. Death. Corruption. We, as mankind, are under a curse. You understand that? Now why do we perceive, pursue that which is dead? Why do we seek after that which is corrupt? Why do we long for that which again destroys? Because that is the nature, not of God, but of the evil one. Who has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's the world that I live in today. And whether you or I completely understand it right now. Amen. He is in the process of bringing death, destruction, and corruption in the lives of our families. Why is America in such the condition it is today? Why do people struggle to have a marriage and we hear so many divorces? Why are we seeing the confusion that's going on right now in our planet? And even some within this church right now. It's because of the curse. And creation itself groans. The word of God says and labors with birth pangs. It's waiting. What, what's it waiting for? For the redemption of the sons of God. Because it knows, creation knows, that when the Redeemer comes, amen, everything's going to change. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Have I lost you somewhere in the process? 
Praise God. Hallelujah. Let me just talk to you this morning. Let me just talk to you. How blessed are the free. I saw it. I saw it today in this house. People free. People free. Some didn't move. And I'll tell you why they didn't move. Because they don't know freedom. They don't know. Amen. You don't have to do what Brother Bryant does. Whatever that is. And some of the others, they jump up and down. You don't have to do that. But blessed are the free. Amen. You see, the reason you responded, because you recognized the spirit that was in this house. It's the spirit of God. And that spirit brings with it freedom. It brings with it freedom. It takes us into heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. It brings to us a liberty in this house, even living in a sin-cursed world. So the majority of the world, it sits on somebody's couch. Not, not our couch, not my couch, not your couch. And they charge them a couple hundred bucks for you to talk to them. And then they write you a script, and you'll go get some mind-altering drug. Amen. Why are they trying to do it? Because they're trying to fix you. But you see, here's the problem. Man can't fix you. Why can't man fix you? Because man is corrupt. Man is, amen, ignore God. Amen. Listen, you want a psychiatrist? Go to one that when you walk in the room, he says, the first thing we're going to do today, sir, ma'am, we're going to get down and we're going to pray and humble ourselves before God. And if he doesn't say that, no, you are in trouble. I'm just telling you. Knowledge puffs up. An understanding of God makes you humble. All right, are you still with me? And so I live in a death and corruption and cursed world. But in the midst of that, blessed are the free. People don't understand that. You see, hallelujah. God told Adam, amen. He said to him, Cursed, in verse 17 of chapter 3, is the ground for your sake. And in toil, or the Bible says in the King James, sorrow. You shall eat of it all the days of your life. Amen. It is worrisome. There is a labor. There is a pain that comes with this cursed ground. There are men in this house and women in this house that go to work sick. Not because they want to, but because they got to take care of their family. And if you're not taking care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. So sorrow has come to mankind. Labor and pain has come to us. It's an aspect of the curse that we're under today. Amen. It's no wonder that you'll read in Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, that Lamech, a righteous man, Lived 182 years and had a son. And what did he name that boy? He named that boy Noah. And the name Noah means rest. I want to have a son named Noah. Why, sir? Because I need some rest. Hallelujah. And he goes on and he says, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So he named his son Noah. Little did he know that it was going to be Noah who would find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Little did he know that God was going to change the situation. He was going to wipe it clean and start all over again. Oh, God, you want rest in your life? The past has to be wiped clean. And if the past is wiped clean, you'll find rest. You'll find a deliverer. And it ain't Moses. But Moses was a type of deliverer. Hallelujah. Are you, are you with me? Are you with me? Hallelujah. It is no accident that when Jesus came to us, he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Anybody in the house today laboring? Anybody in the house today you're under heavy burden? Anybody in the house today needing rest? I'll tell you what you got to do. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your soul. You see, some people think the yoke of God is a burden. It's not a burden. It's a place of rest. Amen. Sin is a burden. And being under the yoke of sin is a burden. Amen. And the reason some of us have not found rest is because we have not learned how to yoke up with God. We're still in charge. And I don't want to be in charge. You see, there's a solution for... Go to Psalm 66 and verse 8. I'm throwing some stuff in here. It's not even in my notes. Amen. Psalm 66 and verse 8. Listen to what it says. You know what? It's 68. 68. I'm sorry. Wrong chapter. Six, go to 68 verse. I'll back up to verse 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. Now listen to what he says. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. If you will not take the yoke of the Lord upon you, you are rebellious and you will dwell in a dry land. Let me also tell you this. Have you ever read about the individual that had devils in them? And the devil was cast out. And the Bible says that that devil went around. Walking where? On dry and dry places you hear me amen so when you are rebellious you are dwelling in a dry land where the enemy dwells and there's no freedom where the enemy dwells so if you want god amen amen to help you and give you a rest you got to take his yoke on you you got to learn to listen to your pastor when he preaches the word of God. It's just not a bunch of stuff. Amen. You need to learn how to obey. And honor. And submit. Because if you're not doing those things. You are walking in a dry land. And that's where the enemy is at. And there's no rest in a dry land. My God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So there's sorrow. You, you, you got to understand something. Amen. If you're a child of God. And, and you're just not having any rest. You need to examine your life and find out where you're at. Amen. Somewhere, somewhere in your life, amen, you are not operating according to the principles of God's word. Amen. And if you are not doing that, you are not going to have rest. But blessed are the free. So, not only does sin bring sorrow, amen, the Bible tells us in Genesis 3 and 18, both thistles, thorns, and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. Amen. The thorns and the thistles. I can't say that today to save my life. The thorns and the thistles <laughs> signify pain. I'm not asking you to raise your hand this morning. I'm not talking right now about physical pain. But there are people in this house that are dealing with emotional pain and mental pain. Amen. You understand. You're dealing with it. Amen. That's because of sin. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 and 3, He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. What does that word sorrow there mean? Pain, affliction, it can be physical and it can be mental. Verse 4 says, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Oh, you need to hear me today. When Jesus in Matthew, amen, 27, amen, when they scourged him in verse 26, and in verse 28, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. The Bible says in verse 29, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They pushed that thing down on him. Why was he allowing that to happen? So that you would not have to deal with the pain and grief and sorrow. The Bible says that love casteth out fear. And fear brings torment. I'm here to tell you right now that my God is in the house. And my God is a God of love. And my God took thorns upon his head. 
He was acquainted. My God. Where do we get all messed up? It ain't our fingers. It ain't our feet. It ain't our toes. It's our head that gets messed up. Some of you believers in this house, you have an offense against somebody and you have never forgiven them. I want you to understand, there is a reason that you face mental anguish. There is a reason that you struggle because you have chosen to hang on to something that doesn't belong to you. It was taken to the cross. Amen. It was on his head. Every pain, every word, every offense, everything that's ever been done to you. He took it on his head. You don't need to carry it anymore. Anymore. The worst thing that people do is live in their past. That's the worst thing you could do as a child of God. You see, the past brings with it death and decay and corruption. But some of us insist on going back there. Amen. We say that we have forgiven somebody, but we can bring up a year later the same incident and hash it out all over again. And we get the same stinking feelings. And we get angry. And we get filled with anxiety. And we get filled with bitterness. And we strike out. He bore it all. The thorns on his head. My God, every believer in this house needs to understand what it means to be free. Blessed are the free. I'm living in a cursed world, but I don't have to live with my past. I don't have to live with an offense that somebody's done to me. You need to get over it. You need to get over it. Do you not understand that if you cannot forgive God will allow you to go into the tormentor prison. And he's not talking about physical bars. He's talking about mental bars. Amen. Where we rehash things over and over and over and over again. Amen. And we can't, amen, look at people like we need to look at people. We can't truly love. Amen. We can't truly give ourselves to somebody because we're filled with the anguish and the pain. I'm preaching to you right now, brothers and sisters. It's time, it's time to allow those thorns that were pushed down on the head of Jesus to bring to you the healing that God intended you to have. You cannot, you cannot live in your past. You cannot continually dwell there because the past brings with it oppression. And there are believers in this house today that are oppressed. And you act accordingly. Are you hearing me? I'm preaching to you right now. I'm preaching to you right now. My God, if you can't forgive, you're going to struggle. You're going to, the enemy's going to just walk all over you. Paul would say in the issues of forgiveness that we are not ignorant of his devices. Do you not understand that that's the land where Satan dwells? He dwells in unforgiveness. He dwells in darkness. Amen. And he'll play that game with you and he'll torment you. He will torment you and torment you and torment you. And the only semblance of freedom you got is when you come into the house of God and somebody's free next to you and you get a little touch of that freedom and it begins to move on you. If you want to be, amen, full of the freedom of God, you've got to let it go. Well, you don't understand, preacher. That's the problem right there. Because what, you are, what you're fixing to say is, they did a bad deed to me, and now we got a problem. I don't read in the Word of God where it says, if they do real bad deeds to you, you don't have to forgive them. All right, all right, man, the place is, man, it's just, I can tell what I've, I've hit. So I've hit a sore spot today. It's so tender right now. You know, I can't do it for you. You can come to you. You can counsel with me all day long. It ain't going to do nothing for you until you can learn to follow the Word of God. And the Word of God says that I am to forgive and hold nothing against anybody. And He took your unforgiveness and your bad situations and the mental situations that you rehash over and over again in your mind, and they were pushed down on His head. I tell you what, you want to know the truth? I'd rather have physical pain than mental pain. There's a God in this house right now that wants to heal you. I ain't just speaking words here. I'm telling you, he wants to heal you. 
But before you can be healed, you must give every offense to him. Does not the word of God say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I shall repay. You lay it in his hands and you leave it alone. You see, they mocked him, they spit on him, they did all kinds of things to him. And it was all mental, ladies and gentlemen. Mental, I mean, it, it'll sap everything from you. It'll make you depressed. I know what depression's all about. I've been there a few times. Pastor's been depressed? Absolutely. You got issues with that? Amen. I'm so happy to be your pastor. There's only one way to get past depression, and that's get up and do what you don't want to do. It's very easy just to sit on the couch and do nothing. Very easy to lay in bed and do nothing. Very easy just to try to sleep the day away. I got freedom. Blessed are the free. Hallelujah. I'm going to be preaching a message soon on grace comes with scars. And I'm not there yet, but I will be there. Amen. I was going to preach it this week, but I, I didn't preach it this week. It's coming. And I'll probably cry and blubber through the whole stinking thing. But uh, I'll be all right. We may think the pastor's whacked. You know, you're so filled with grief, you can't do it. No, I'm not paralyzed. I'm not paralyzed. I'm walking in the freedom of God. My God. My God. It's more than just a dance and a shout up here. Okay. The reason you're dancing and shouting up here is because you're walking in somebody's freedom. You need to get it for yourself. Are you all still in the house? Did I lose anybody? All right. So we get sorrow. We got pain. And the Bible tells us in the 19th verse of chapter 3, it says, In the sweat of your face you will eat bread till the, you return to the ground. For out of it were you taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Our labor is hard today. Uh, our tears can be very hard. Sweat. There are people in this room that soak their pillows with their tears. And they're not tears of intercession. They're tears of hard labor. The Bible says in Luke 22 and 20, 44, it says, In being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then he sweat, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The Bible says in the message, he prayed all the harder. Sweat wrung from him like drops of blood poured out off of his face. Hebrews 5 and 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears. I want my tears to be tears of righteousness that are sown to bring somebody to salvation. Not tears of pain. Not tears, amen, of frustration. Not tears of struggle just this life. You see, blessed are the free. They're blessed. Hallelujah. Revelation said there's no more curse. Can, can, can I get this thing done? Can I get it done? Genesis 3, 19 says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. And then it ends with, For dust you are, and dust you shall return. Are you still with me? Have I gone too long? I got to get this thing done. You know, I am not under the curse of sin. Hey, you got to stay with me now. Follow what I'm going to say. My body is under the curse of sin. I'm not under the curse of sin. I am made up of body soul, and spirit. Do you know what Paul said in the 15th chapter of Corinthians? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I am free from the curse of death. I am not getting it. That's true. It's true. Wait a minute, you lost a son a little bit over 40 days ago. The body died. Are you hearing me? The body died. Paul said it like this. To be absent from the body is to be 
present with the Lord. I'm not living under a curse. Kill me. Go ahead, kill me. You don't understand. You're doing me a favor. You're doing me a favor. Some of you fear death. Well, I'm here to tell you, if God doesn't come, it's going to come your way. And you ain't going to stop it. Well, the Lord's coming. Oh, that's, that's a presumption on your part. Well, the Lord's going to. I know many that said the Lord's going to come, and, and they're gone. And by the way, he may not come for 10 years, but there's no guarantee that you'll be around in 10 years. I am not under the curse of death. Why? Because I live with a promise. That's why we start singing. I can only imagine and something starts fluttering in me. And it ain't the flesh that's fluttering. It's the spirit and the soul. So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we recognize that. We know what that's going to be like a little bit. You understand what I'm saying? My God, I'm 60 years old. And you think I'm going to live another 60 years? Are you nuts? I may be blessed to get to 70. I may not. That's what you you know. And you may sorrow over me when I pass, or you may clap and stand up and say, yeah. <laughs> but know this. My race will be over. Physical death. I hate it. I've had too many funerals. You see, what goes back to dust is of the dust. Your spirit goes back to God, which made it. Your soul is in God's hand. You understand? Amen. Death does not hold power over me anymore. The Bible tells us. In fact, Jesus, amen, it, it describes it in Psalms 22, verse 15. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. Verse 15. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of the earth. For the dogs surrounded me, and the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And he's hung on a tree. If you know anything about Deuteronomy, he says, Cursed is he that has hung on a tree. And Galatians 3, 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Amen. And Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus who made him a little lower than the angels. Who was made a little lower than the angel, for the suffering of the death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2 14. Inasmuch as his children have been partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Let me, let me just run it by you again. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15 21. For since by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Have you not heard the scripture? Amen. Jesus says, you do error not knowing the scripture when they got into the discussion of whose wife she's going to be. And he said, have you ever said what, have you ever heard what it says? It does not say that he was the God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. He said, He is the God. In other words, he, what he is saying is, There's life. And I'm free. And blessed are the free. My God. What would happen to us if we could grab a hold of what I'm talking about right now? What would happen to us? What would happen to us? I'll tell you what happened to them. Death didn't scare them. I talked to a man recently. His name was Titus Mathis. Matthew from India. Titus Matthew from India. Okay, you know what he told me? I was just talking to him. He said, Thomas came to India. The guy that we call Doubting Thomas, it's recorded that he came to southern India. All right? And he preached the gospel there. Ah, well, he preached the same thing that Peter preached. Amen. And that it was messing with all those other religious groups and they and according to him he said they came and stabbed Thomas in the back killed him I didn't bother Thomas you see because he was not living under the fear of death and if you're living under the fear of death you got torment and there are people that are tormented in this house this morning but blessed are the free time for me to quit my God and so 
John says there'll be no more curse. No more curse. There'll be no more night. Terror comes in the night, but there is no night there. Are you free in God today? Are you free? Are you free? He wants you to be free. He wants you to walk in freedom like you were doing before. He wants you to walk in liberty. He does. He does. Can we just bow our heads right now in this room? I can tell you, if you want liberty in your life, obviously the first step of liberty comes in believing what his word says and believing that he is the Savior, the Messiah. And in believing that, you will follow the word of what he tells us to do. And the thing he tells us to do is to repent. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want freedom, it starts with repentance. All right. Can we right now in this room, amen, if you've had ugly times with your husband or your wife or with your children, or you have done things that you know were not what God wants you to do, this would be an opportunity to ask God to forgive you. Ask God to forgive you. You see, by doing that, it takes you from that darkness to light. And God operates in light. And there's freedom in God. And blessed are the free. Can we right now, can we right now, right now in this room, God, forgive us. Forgive us. I don't have to live under the curse. You took the curse upon yourself. Hallelujah. I have been released from the fear of death, which held us in bondage. I don't have to live with a curse in my mind. I don't have to live with anger and rejection, bitterness and unforgiveness. That's, that's the old guy. I'm free. Jesus, you took my sorrow, my pain, my tears, and my death upon yourself. When you were buried, but you rose again. And if I repent of my sin, and if I'm obedient to your word by being buried with you in baptism, you have promised me resurrection life. And in that resurrection life is freedom, a spirit of freedom. My God in this house, can we just pray right now? Can we just pray right now?